One of the first new concepts that players learn when playing Magic is to tap land to generate mana to cast your spells. This is one of the pillars of what makes Magic the game it is. While extremely uncommon, there are some lands out there which do not tap for mana at all. Missing a land drop in the early game is a shaky start for many competitive decks, so to actively trade one of your mana producing lands for one that does not tap for mana is inherently a drawback that most decks aren't willing to chance. Today, however, we'll be looking at the exceptions to the rule as you look at the best lands that do not have mana abilities. Starting us off at number 10, we have Diamond Valley. This is a simple card in that you can tap it to sacrifice a creature and gain life equal to that creature's toughness. Life gain is a sort of effect at its most potent when incidental, and such, at face value, running a card like Diamond Valley might seem to be a terrible choice. It asks you to take a turn off from advancing your mana and instead play a card that can only gain you life and only if you sacrifice a creature. However, Diamond Valley does have its uses, essentially allowing you to get extra value out of a creature before it dies in combat or to one of your opponent's effects. While not relevant in any modern formats, the card did see historical play around 2008 built around using a card like Shaman Encore to pump Task Force's toughness infinitely by targeting it repeatedly with Shaman's damage prevention ability. Then the player could sacrifice Task Force to Diamond Valley and have an effectively unbeatable life total at the end of the game. This is hardly impressive in the modern game, and Diamond Valley really only shows up in the odd commander deck here or there these days. Despite this, it still earns the 10th spot on this list, if only because other lands without mana abilities not already above Diamond Valley on this list, like Ice Flow, are so much worse that Diamond Valley makes it onto this list almost out of default. And at number 9, we have Vesuva. Vesuva is a play on the long-running trope of clone effects in Magic. Instead of copying any creature in play like a traditional clone effect, instead Vesuva copies any other land on the battlefield. While copying another land, Vesuva does enter the battlefield tapped, Otherwise, every deck would probably run four copies of Vesuva because even copying a basic land would be good. But since Vesuva does enter tapped, it's relegated more to being a combo card. The most common competitive home for Vesuva is Amulet Titan decks, combo-oriented land decks that use Primeval Titan to search out key lands from the deck and put them onto the battlefield whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks. Vesuva in this deck is a potent tech card, able to copy any of the lands the deck runs, such as entering as another copy of Bojuka Bog to empty a graveyard, or as an extra copy of Valakut the Multi-Pinnacle the deck's primary win condition. What separates Vesuva from a card like Thespian Stage, a land that can also become another land, but does so when already on the board, is that Vesuva has and triggers any enter the battlefield effects that the land it copies had as it enters the battlefield. Thespian Stage is already on the board when it becomes another land, and as such, while it will have an ability, it will not be able to trigger it. This isn't inherently an upside or a downside, as Thespian Stage Restriction actually allows it to combo with another card higher on this list. Vesuva is flexible and in the right deck, quite strong, but is narrow enough that it doesn't see wide play outside of more combo-oriented strategies. Along with the fact that once on the battlefield, Vesuva is generally going to be a normal land like any other, and lose its distinction of lacking a mana ability, Vesuva only manages the ninth spot on this list. And at number 8, we have Eye of Ugin. This legendary land, while lacking a way to produce mana, does actually assist in the casting of your spells by making each colorless Eldrazi spell you cast cost 2 less to cast. In their initial print run in the Zendikar block, Eldrazi were limited to large creatures like Olamog's Crusher, and thus Eye of Ugin was mostly relegated to an option in big mana decks to help speed out their game-ending threats. In these decks, the cost down effect would often be secondary to the ability to pay 7 mana to search your library for any colorless creature and put it into your hand. But, with the Battle for Zendigar block, Magic the Gather would introduce a new wave of Eldrazi support. This wave of support included lower cost Eldrazi spells, such as Eldrazi Mimic, which would cost little to no mana with Eye of Ugin on the battlefield. This birthed the Eldrazi Aggro deck, which would speed through the early game and drop mid-range threats like Reality Smasher and tear through your opponent's comparatively modest board. Eventually, Eye of Ugin was even banned in the modern format for being simply too fast. Eldrazi Aggro does still exist in the Legacy format, which is a much faster format and thus better equipped to handle the deck than modern. However, given the fact that Ivugan does technically still help the player accelerate their mana, despite not providing any direct mana itself, Ivugan falls short of the other cards on this list that have little to nothing to do with mana at all. Beyond this, despite being potent enough to be banned, Ivugan does only work in a deck built around Eldrazi, and thus is more narrow than many of the other options ahead of it on this list. And at number 7, we have Urborg, Tomb of Yogmoth. This land has the ability to make every land a swamp. This does technically give Urborg a mana ability, since it counts itself for its own effect. However, this mana ability is not inherent to Urborg, and given to every land on the battlefield. Since Urborg does not replace any land types and is purely additive, it can actually be used to help circumvent some of the other cost of lands in your deck. For example, a deck running Mana Confluence would, under most circumstances, take 1 damage every time it tapped Mana Confluence for mana. However, with Urborg, if the player wished to only make a black mana, 
they could use the land's new abilities of Swamp to tap for one black mana. This is a separate ability to Meta Confluence's printed mana ability, and thus the life loss tied to it does not come into play. Of course, this is also true for your opponent, who will also benefit from the effect just as much as you do. But even then, this can be used to Urbog's player's advantage if built around, with cards like Filth that actively punish your opponent for having swamps. Generally speaking, there's no guarantee that your opponent will be able to benefit from their free black mana. But there are cases where this card will allow your opponent to cast cards in their hand while they're waiting on more black mana to be able to use. Urborg has also recently seen a green counterpart printed in Yavi Maya Cradle of Growth, which does the same thing but for forests and could be considered to share this entry with Urborg for just how similar it is. While neither of these effects are prone enough that they've spawned build around decks, their utility and general ease to run in a deck, given they don't even put you behind on mana like most other lands on this list, earns them at least the number 7 spot. And at number 6, we have Glacial Chasm. This is a land that, beyond not having a mana ability, also requires you to sacrifice a land as it enters the battlefield, makes it so you're no longer able to attack, and it has a cumulative upkeep cost of 2 life, which means on the first upkeep after you play Glacial Chasm, you'll have to pay 2 life or sacrifice it. Then on your next turn you'll have to pay 4 life or sacrifice it, and so on and so on until the player is forced to sacrifice Glacial Chasm. All of this on top of the fact the land not producing mana by itself is a drawback enough to disqualify multiple cards from playability. One would imagine the same for Chasm and its multiple hefty drawbacks. However, the payoff for dealing with these downsides is a land that prevents all damage that would be dealt to you. This makes Glacial Chasm a steep cost, but a potentially game-saving card depending on when it's played. With Glacial Chasm on board, if your opponent cannot remove the land, the only way you'll be losing any life at all is with the cumulative upkeep. Of course, thanks to being unable to attack, you're not able to do much to pressure your opponent either. This is why Glacial Chasm's primary function is a way to force combo decks to buy time. Land combo decks and Legacy can search up Glacial Chasm with a card like Crop Rotation, and can bring both it and the land sacrifice to play it back to the hand with a card like Life from Loam to help you buy even more time until you find your game-winning combo. Now, Glacial Chasm only ranks here and not any higher because the cards ahead of it are even stronger, some of which being even more vital pieces to the same legacy land decks that Glacial Chasm sees the most play in. And at number 5, we have Maze of Ith. This is a land that one can tap to untap an attacking creature and prevent all damage done to and by that creature. Essentially, this means removing the creature from combat without actually doing so. For example, if someone attacks with Akari Zev, Skyship Raider, you will still create the Ragavan token even if you tap Maze of Ith. This both saves your Akari Zev from dying in combat, and allows her to get her effect no matter how dangerous your opponent's board presence is. Maze of Ith can also be used defensively to prevent damage from a dangerous creature attacking you. This is especially potent in Legacy format where many top decks tend to focus more on singular attackers like Death's Shadow. Maze of Ith keeping an opponent's best creature out of combat fairly consistently allows the Maze of Ith player to build up a tempo advantage. As an older card lacking a main set reprint, much like Glacial Chasm, Maze of Ith sees play mostly in the Legacy and Commander formats, where the whole game's card pool is up for grabs bar in the ban list. And while it may be stuck mostly in Legacy, it is quite potent there in the aforementioned land combo decks as another tool to make the game go longer and buy more time for your deck to pull off its central combo. Coming in at number 4, we have Fetch Lands. Fetch lands refer to a cycle of 10 lands, the first half of which were initially printed in Odyssey, and the other half first printed in Zendikar. These 10 lands all have the same ability, with each one working with a different two-color pairing. You may pay one life, tap, and sacrifice one of these fetch lands to search your deck for a land that has one of the two types listed. For example, Windsweth Heath searches your library for a forest or plains and puts it into the battlefield. Notably, this also applies to non-basic lands with basic land types meaning Winsleth Heath can allow you to search for a copy of Temple Garden just as easily. These fetch lands are among the most widely spread cards in the game, and are staples in every format they're legal in. While at service level, these may seem like nothing more than filler that can be replaced with lands that actually do tap for colors, fetch lands actually represent a great deal of utility and flexibility. If you draw a Swamp for turn, it can only ever be a Swamp. But if you draw a Marsh Flats for turn, then while it could be a Swamp, it could also be a Plains or even an underground sea. Fetch lands essentially allow the player to more easily find their colors, especially when coupled with dual lands with basic land types. Most competitive decks in non-rotating formats that are more than one color use fetch lands for this reason, as well as being able to thin the deck and fill the graveyard up with more fetch lands after being sacrificed. And at number 3, we have Bazaar Baghdad. First printed in Arabian Nights, Bazaar Baghdad was written off as a horribly unplayable card in those early years of the game. A player can tap Bazaar to draw two cards, and then discard three. This is inherently card disadvantage, having to throw away an extra third card to make up for the two that you drew. Coupled with this being the only ability the land has, and it was no surprise that Bazaar Baghdad was unplayable for its earliest years. But as the game advanced and grew, so too did the strength of cards in the graveyard. 
Bizarre would reach the height of its playability with the introduction of the dredge mechanic in Ravnica. Cards with dredge essentially allow the player to replace the time that they draw and instead mill as many cards as the dread card says and return the added dredge cards from your graveyard back to your hand. This mechanic was designed to allow people to reuse their cards via milling away other ones, but in practice, dredge cards were instead used as an engine to mill as many cards as possible. As such, dredge decks latched onto Bizarre Baghdad as both a source of a card draw to replace the dredging and a way to put more dredge cards into the graveyard via the discard. Decks built around this round cards such as Necromiba to swarm the board with small creatures that come out after being milled. This led to an extremely fast combo deck and multiple dredge cards being banned in multiple formats. And of course, Bizarre Baghdad itself, being an older card, was only legal in Legacy and Vintage, and was eventually banned in Legacy for being too potent there. To this day, Bizarre Baghdad is only legal in Vintage when it comes to sanctioned formats, and to this day, Dredge is a consistent contender in the format. And at number 2, we have the Tabernacle at Pendril Vale. This legendary land's ability makes it so that, for each creature, destroy that creature unless its controller pays one generic mana. This symmetrical effect might seem tame on paper, but completely warps the game around itself. On turn 3, a player is likely to have probably 3 mana and maybe a creature too. On that player's upkeep, they'll be forced to either use a sizable portion of their available land to save their creatures, or let those creatures die in exchange for having more available mana. Essentially, this card taxes players for their creatures, meaning a deck like Goblins that swarms the board with small cheap creatures will struggle to play the game at all since their resources are being spread so thin. This is made all the more potent by the player running Tabernacle most often building the deck to have little to no trouble playing around it. Its most common home, the aforementioned Lands combo deck, uses this to stonewall more aggressive decks out of the early game while putting together a winning board. But the Tabernacle beyond this is also a very strong sideboard card for the decks when they're matched up against an aggressive, creature-focused deck. If anything, the biggest thing pushing Tabernacle from being even more ubiquitous in the few formats it's legal in is that the card is very old and very expensive, with no reprints of the market to help make the card more accessible. And finally, at number 1, we have Dark Depths. This card enters the battlefield with 10 ice counters on it, and it doesn't do much of anything else when you first play it. For 3 mana, you can remove 1 ice counter from Dark Depths, and once the land has no more ice counters on it, you create a Merit Lodge, a 2020 flying indestructible creature token. This is the primary win condition of the Legacy land decks, most often via comboing with a card Thespian Stage to copy Dark Depths but not gain the ice counters, and thus get Merit Lodge right away. What makes Dark Depths so potent is the inevitability of it. While there are ways to kill the Merit Lodge token, thanks to it being indestructible, the most common answers to it like Swords to Plowshares only serve to buy the Dark Depths player even more time to assemble their combo. And as previously discussed in this list, there are multiple lands that decks can use to help buy more time and stave off that aggression. This is why Dark Depths takes the top spot over cards like Tabernacle, which may seem stronger and more elusive on paper. Dark Depths is the card that ties them all together, gives these slow, atypical lands a chance to work in spite of their drawbacks and eventually end the game with a threat that's difficult to remove. Most often in Magic, your win conditions are big flashy spells that cost mana, or at the very least are straightforward for your opponent to interact with. Instead, your opponent has to be able to answer a land, or if unable to do that, a creature token with protection that can make another copy of it if they find another copy of Dark Depths. The card was potent enough that it was banned in Modern, relegating combo-centric land decks to older formats like Legacy. Given Dark Depths' long-term legacy as one of the most threatening win conditions throughout decades of organized play, no other card really felt deserving of this top spot. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any cards you think we may have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, please let us know down in the comments below.